The following program is a work of broadcast students from the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland over the past week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their BCIT instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, RCMP are investigating a shooting at SFU's Surrey campus. And protests in Vancouver over Dick Cheney's book tour turned violent. And downtown east side residents are looking for a change. Hello and welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Carmen Weld. And I'm Martin McMahon. An SFU student is dead after a shooting in Surrey. I went to the scene on the morning following the killing and filed this story. A 19-year-old Simon Fraser University student was shot dead early Wednesday morning at the City Centre Mall Parkade in Surrey. The RCMP have now confirmed the victim was Maple Battaglia, an aspiring actress and model. All I can tell you is that she was uh, the victim of significant gunshot wounds beyond where she may have uh, sustained those wounds and how, uh, I'm not in a position to confirm that would be premature at this point. The killing has left the SFU community shocked and rattled. Yeah, well if I'm emotional it's hardly surprising. One of our students has been shot dead. Of course I'm emotional. It's a terrible shock to all of us. We certainly would encourage anyone who has not spoken to a police officer in regards to this incident if they have information to call the IHIT tip line and provide us with that information so we can attempt to move forward and identify the individual or individuals that might be responsible for this homicide and the death of this 19 year old woman. 25 officers have been assigned to the case for the first 72 hours but police haven't said whether there are any suspects at this time or whether they believe the killing was targeted or random. Martin McMahon in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. We headed to SFU the following morning to find out more about this tragedy. In the shadow of SFU's Surrey campus, a small candle burns for Maple Battaglia. People pass the memorial only a day after her senseless murder. I think it's only an accident. I'm feeling so bad for that lady, but um, I'm feeling it's, it's only an accident and I don't think it might be happened again. It's, it's unbelievable. I don't think I'll be able to walk past this parking lot without having it on my conscience. It's a tragedy that the community will not soon forget. Dick Cheney's book tour reached Vancouver and was met with hundreds of protesters claiming he should not have been led in Canada. I was at the protest and filed this report. A peaceful protest broke out in violence in Vancouver this week as Dick Cheney was in town to promote his book at the Vancouver Club. Over 250 protesters attended alleging Cheney's war criminal status should not have allowed him in Vancouver. Code Pink and the lawyers against the war let their presence be known and were disappointed at our government's choice. I can't believe that people would pay $500 to go and see a war criminal, a known person who has admitted that he believes that torture is legitimate. Local MP Don Davies is disgusted someone like Cheney would be allowed in Canada given his acts of torture. If you just take waterboarding, that is an act of torture. It involves strapping a person to a table, upside down, pouring liquid down their throat until they think they're going to die. So there's no excuse uh, on the government's part. They were aware that he was coming and they could have taken action. And uh, their silence has been deafening. The Stop War Coalition organized the protests and wants Canada to follow the European model. Cheney and Bush, they can't go to Europe. Uh, Switzerland has told them don't show up, they'll be arrested. Uh, even the Conservative mayor of London said to George Bush, don't come to London, you're going to get arrested. So we have to change our government here in, uh, in Canada because it's an embarrassment to the world. I'm on the sidewalk here because my government should be here and they're not here. We live in a society where citizens are trying to fight against war torture but our own city's police department is protecting him and letting facilitate such event. Protests lasted into the night and extra police had to be called in. Dick Cheney's event went off as scheduled as he had actually arrived undercover earlier in the afternoon. Carmen Weld in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine.
there's a growing concern on the downtown east side regarding public bathrooms. Reporter Connor Hammond spoke to upset residents. Pigeon Park has long been a staple of the downtown east side. This location offers more than just a place for people to huddle out of the rain, as it has one of the very few public bathrooms in the region. But for people who are looking to use these facilities, all that greets them is a locked door and a graffitied sign. Needless to say, this concerns some of the residents here on the downtown east side. They had a few cans around here, that wouldn't be like that. The tourists wouldn't be so uh, disgusted, you know. Why are they not taking better care of them? Why don't they just put outhouses down here or I'll start letting them be open for free? Rather than putting in something like this so expensive and then they have to maintain it and they don't want to maintain it, so why not just put outhouses down here whereas people just use them for free? I've seen lineups on here. When they have their Sunday market down here, there's usually a lineup for people to use this bathroom and when it's not working, they're going in back alleys and that's not a very clean thing to do. Cope Parks Board candidate Brent Granby agrees with the concerns of these residents. Particularly for vulnerable populations, folks who live on the street, people in wheelchairs, seniors, public washrooms are extremely important for them because if they don't have public washrooms, then the only thing they have is to go in the alleyways. So if you have to go, you have to go. This unsanitary trend, Granby thinks, will stop with a combined effort from the city and the parks board. It's a city washroom in a park board space. So what we're calling for is there needs to be greater cooperation between the city through the Department of Engineering and through park board. Until this course of action begins, residents have to cope with using other bathroom options. Connor Hammond in Vancouver, for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, a local fire hall is in need of applicants. And bike lanes are on the radar with a city election right around the corner. They say if you want a wish to come true, never tell anyone. But there is one wish that can make the difference between life and death. And this wish can only come true if you tell someone. Please let your family know you want to be an organ donor. With the municipal election around the corner, Vancouver's nonpartisan association is starting to release parts of their platform. While novelty streetcars and budget revamps are on the table, much of the conversation keeps turning to bike lanes. Rafferty Baker has this story. I want to fix that bike lane. If it can't be fixed, it has to be changed. Suzanne Anton rolled out more of the nonpartisan association's election campaign, and bike lanes are still high on the list. I don't want to tear out a $3 million piece of infrastructure if I don't have to. That's why I'm determined to look at what the problems are and see if those problems can be addressed. Anton and the other NPA candidates are stuck trying to slam Mayor Gregor Robertson's bike lanes while supporting urban cycling in general. I've never owned a car. I own two bikes, a skateboard and a bus pass. So if you want to talk to me about how I get around the city, that's how I do it. And I've lived downtown in Vancouver for 15 years and that's how it's always been. I've spent my whole life on a bike. I know about good bike facilities. Secondly, you know that the NPA put in 400 kilometers of bike lanes around the city and smooth as butter. There was never a problem with them. The worst problem facing cyclists in downtown Vancouver is theft. To me, it would be really smart if we started focusing on bike lockups, for example, uh, so we can have that kind of security and safety so people can use their cycles uh, in the downtown area. There are some fresh ideas on the table, but it looks like the NPA will run a campaign on some pretty familiar issues. Rafferty Baker in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. While the NPA gets their platform in order, the Coalition of Progressive Electors, or COPE, is beginning to hammer away at their key campaign issues. Again, Rafferty Baker brings us this report. COPE candidate for Park Board Brent Granby is more bullish on downtown bike lanes than COPE's NPA counterparts. 
So anybody who says they don't want to see an expansion of bike cycling and, uh, and public transportation downtown is saying they don't want to see downtown Vancouver expand economically. Hope City Councillor Ellen Woodsworth slams the NPA proposal to bring streetcars back to Vancouver's roads. Street cars are way back. Uh, until it can be proven there's some money to pay for them that doesn't take away from existing services, then this is just cotton candy she's handing out to try to attract, uh, attract voters. But for Woodsworth, the priority is public safety in the troubled downtown east side. I think that we need to make sure that there is affordable housing because right now women are often sleeping with people who are not safe because they don't have the money to afford their own room. And some of Cope's messages seem to resonate with the people in the community down here. Safety is the first thing and that's securing the windows of the downtown east side hotel. That's all I'm asking for. If I had a million dollars that's what I would go for is the already in the community organizations, Average Factor, the Carnegie, uh, Insight, you know, they, you know they're, 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 they're stretched to the limit. And to spend the, over 20% of our budget on enforcement when that's just trying to put a lid on something that's exploding. With the NPA trying to keep taxes down, COPE is focusing on helping Vancouver's most vulnerable. Clearly each party is courting a dramatically different voter base. Rafferty Baker in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Firefighting is a dream for every starry-eyed youngster. In certain districts, however, the number of applicants has dropped off. Connor Hammond investigates. It's the end of the road for some of Coquitlam's veteran laddermen as they are hanging up their jackets for the last time. While the numbers of applicants have dropped, Fire Chief Tony Delmonico believes the reason is because Coquitlam Fire and Rescue are asking for more prerequisites on applications. I think it's dropped off a lot from, to say, 10 years ago and prior to that because the restrictions weren't as great. We didn't ask for as many qualifications as we do now. Spencer Hughes, a six-year veteran, knows all about the physical grind that goes along with training to become a fireman. We were out in the train ground every day, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, pulling hose and over and over again and doing the basic tasks. And then after the five and a half weeks, then we were allowed to be on the trucks and we do then the probationary period of one year. Delmonica says having a trade in your back pocket is also beneficial when time comes to enter a burning building. If they come in with a, a TQ or a red seal on uh, one of the major uh, trades, it really helps, be it elect electrical, plumbing, uh, sprinkler fitting. Uh, carpentry, those are very helpful because it helps the firefighters understand the building and uh, how fire reacts on the building. If you have any questions regarding applying to the Coquitlam Fire and Rescue, please contact their head office. Connor Hammond, ready to battle a blaze in Coquitlam for BCIT Magazine. For more about this story, we're joined now by reporter Connor Hammond. Connor, you mentioned having a trade improves people's chances of getting a job. Uh, what are the suggested certifications? Well, Martin, it's the old adage, the more certificates you have on your resume, the greater the opportunity to get the job. For example, out here in Coquitlam, they're asking people to go out and get what's called swift water training. Also, any future fireman looking to apply should look into taking some courses at a post-secondary school before uh, handing in their resume. Martin? So is this the first time uh, Coquitlam Fire and Rescue has used media as a way of uh, gaining interest? According to Fire Chief Tony Delmonico, while they do have different means of getting the word out about these job availabilities, one of the best ways is through the media. You see, the media has access not only on the local front, but nationally via the web. So all in all, I think they think that uh, this resource is pretty effective. Martin? Thanks, Connor. The tragic death of a downtown Eastside resident last week is still shrouded in mystery. The police haven't labeled the death a homicide, but eyewitnesses think it was a murder. Reporter Rafferty Baker has a story. And a warning that some viewers may find the content disturbing. I had a slice of pizza and I was going to head home. And then I was crossing the street. I looked up and I seen Werner come out of the sixth floor window, come down head first, and then seen all the brain matter and everything else.
James Mickelson has lived at the Regent Hotel for years. Like most residents of the Single Room Occupancy, or SRO, Mickelson was fond of Verna Simard. But tragically, Simard plunged to her death on September 16th. The Vancouver police haven't declared the death a homicide. In a press release, Constable Jana McGuinness says, This is a tragic loss of life, and our investigators are working hard to determine the circumstances that led up to her death. But Mickelson and DJ O'Brien, who lives across the street at the Belmoral, say they witnessed a violent dispute leading to Simard's deadly fall. You could hear them yeah. fighting before that oh, happened. Oh yeah, before even. it happened, yeah. yeah. And like, you can hear it really clearly. They let everybody out here hear them scream. Come scream for help. Somebody help me. And Mickelson says he saw Simard's boyfriend actually push her out the window. He just grabbed her literally and then out the window. Police continue to investigate Simard's death. Meanwhile, her friends in the community remember her with the memorial where she died. Rafferty Baker in Vancouver, BCIT Magazine. With your BCIT community calendar, I'm Anita Stankia. The 12th annual Vancouver International Improv Festival is going on on Granville Island right now. With performers from around the world as well as Vancouver entertaining audiences until October 1st. The festival will host 20 different shows along with workshops. Tickets are starting at $35 and are available on the website. The CIBC Run for a Cure is on October 2nd. Runners will lace up for the fight against breast cancer. Runners can choose between a 1 km and a 5 km route. People are encouraged to sign up as an individual, team, or just make a donation online. You can find more information about the run at runforthecure.com. Vancouver's first ever Chinese cultural festival is set to start on October 2nd. The festival coincides with the 60th anniversary of the Chinese National Day. Partygoers will be treated to live music, entertainment and arts, all with a Chinese cultural theme. For more information or tickets, go online to vccf.net. For BCIT Magazine Community Calendar, I'm Anita Stankia. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, BCIT hosts River Day celebrations. And a troubled Maple Ridge family receives help from their community. This is me. And my mom and dad. And my big brother, Alex. And Jack. This is the day I learned that sandals got their name from sand. That jellyfish aren't made of jelly. That stars don't just come from the sky. That the ocean is bigger than all of us. This is the day we all got to forget I was sick. This was my wish. Welcome back. BCIT hosted its first ever Mushroom Cup, a Mario Kart tournament that was created to bring different types of students together on campus. Brady Notes has this story. Students busy studying sometimes need a break. The BCIT Student Association, in conjunction with Press Start Games, are hoping to get some students relaxed by joining the Mushroom Cup, a week-long Mario Kart tournament. Press Start Games owner Russell Bradley discusses how the tournament operates. It operates on a time trial, so basically people come in, they start on Mario Circuit 1, which is the first circuit of the Mushroom Cup, and they play um, five laps, and the best time of those laps will get a small prize, and the next days we'll do other circuits of the Mushroom Cup, and the best overall time at the end of the week will get a big prize. A voucher from the BCIT SA for the stores around campus, and uh, Super Nintendo with Mario World and Mario Kart. Russell takes down the times as students play hoping to get the best record. However, this event is about community as Dan Close explains. We originally planned these kind of events because we want people to um, come together at BCIT and it not be about necessarily your course or your program or your set etc. Um, come and experience a game tournament where you're involved with all other people from BCIT. Expecting over 100 students to play in the first day, the Mushroom Cup is projecting at least 250 students each day as the tournament progresses. 
with daily prizes and a grand prize for the best times, the Mushroom Cup is assured to be a success. Braden Notes in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. With a look at this month's upcoming movies, Kaylee Ramsey joins us with her Minute at the Movies. Thanks, Carmen. There are two big movies coming out on October 7th. First, there's The Ides of March. This political thriller has a star-studded cast, including Canadian Ryan Gosling and George Clooney, who directed and co-wrote the film. Gosling plays staff member Stephen, who gets a crash course in dirty politics when he gets involved in a scandal that threatens his candidate's shot at presidency. This film got great reviews at TIFF earlier this month. Ryan Gosling is hot right now, and we can't wait to see how he does in The Ides of March. Also out October 7th is Real Steel. This action film is set in the near future where boxing has become high-tech, and eight-foot-tall steel robots take over the boxing ring. Hugh Jackman plays Car Charlie Kenton, who makes low-end robots from scrap metal, and takes them from one underground boxing ring to the next. The animatronics look pretty impressive, but we'll have to see how this one stacks up, opening against the Ides of March. And finally, the much-anticipated remake of Footloose. The 1984 original shot Kevin Bacon to fame. The new version has Kenny Wormald as Wren, who is a city boy that moves to a small town where rock and roll and dancing have been banned. Julianne Huff stars as Ariel, the minister's daughter, who tempts Wren into bringing dancing back to Beaumont. This film has a lot to live up to. The original is an absolute classic. Moviegoers everywhere will be kicking off their Sunday shoes when Footloose hits theaters October 14th. Thanks, Kaylee. A Maple Ridge family dealing with a recent loss have received a much-needed boost from an entire home renovation from the Cornerstone Home Team. I was there when they revealed the new home. Here in Maple Ridge, the Kerr's family has just come home to a brand new house after being in Disneyland for a well-deserved vacation. The Kerr's family lost their father just this January, and the Home Team charity felt they were the perfect choice for a new home. My husband died in January and, and that was, you know, sort of, I guess, the catalyst for it. He, it was something we were doing together and everything was a little bit overwhelming, so I think they just wanted to help. Oh, it's awesome to see the result and the family, how excited they are and the, and the improvements that we made to their house and how that's going to change their life. No, this is our ninth project, so... Uh, this is one of the bigger ones that we've done, um, but a lot of businesses want to just keep going. They keep asking me when's the next one, so we'll probably carry on for a while. It's a way for us to get back to the community, and uh, it's just an awesome feeling to be able to help people out and help people out that are struggling, and, uh, and the community really wants to rally around people like that, so it's neat to see how the community chips in, too. You know, the house is beautiful and, and it'll be nice because we can just sit and enjoy the house. But what's more, what's more nice about is everyone coming together and I think there's a lot of good people in this world and it's, an, it's, it's, it's heartwarming to know that. And my husband was a very good person and he always said, what goes around comes around. That's true. To new beginnings and a fresh start for this family, I'm Carmen Weld in Maple Ridge for BCIT Magazine. With pollution and climate change threatening the environment, one conservationist is passing along his fight to future generations. Reporter Matt Van Deventer was at BC Rivers Day to bring you this story. BCIT's Mark Angelo is celebrating BC Rivers Day a little closer to home. Angelo is the founder of the event, but the message has reached a global audience. BC Rivers Day uh, is something we started back in 1980, and it's grown to a point where within our province alone, we've got well over 100 events around the world. We have more than 65 countries involved and literally millions of participants. Uh, so people around the world are, are celebrating the values of our rivers and, and the need to ensure we properly care for them. Angelo and other conservationists have recently seen the return of salmon to the once polluted and desolate Britannia Creek. The stream that runs through BCIT is another waterway that underwent extreme restoration, but the Gishong Creek project is still ongoing. This stream was severely damaged 40 years ago. It was pretty much a lifeless drainage ditch, but I knew a century ago it was at one time a vibrant little stream, and we finally got to a point where we could make that happen. Volunteers help weed out invasive species and plant native vegetation along the banks of the creek. 
They hope to create a flourishing ecosystem. And, and if we can restore some of that through either taking out rubbish or plants or planting something that should should be in there that helps uh, the rest of the sort of general ecology, it's, it's kind of what we're after. Angelo helps a group of children release trout into the creek. He hopes the day's events will be remembered throughout their lifetime. Matthew Van Venter in Burnaby, BCIT Magazine. A recent recipient of a $50,000 scholarship has decided to pursue her passion for journalism by attending BCIT. Braden Oates reports. Kaylee Miller is your typical BCIT student, hardworking, intelligent, and has a passion for journalism. The only difference? She doesn't have to worry about finances after winning a $50,000 scholarship. When I found out I had won the scholarship, I was absolutely thrilled, obviously. I had just flown back from Toronto. I had a really grueling two-day interviews um, for the scholarship, and they said, oh, we'll call you the next day. I got the call saying that I had won the scholarship, and I jumped around and screened for a little while because I was so ecstatic. Kaylee's story is inspiring her classmates to think more about community involvement, but do they have the time? My current schedule is quite tight, actually. Um, I think I probably, if I made time for it, I probably could. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the motivation um, or anything else. All of her community work is in the here and outside of here has paid off for her, and you know she has a huge scholarship. So why wouldn't everybody want to get involved in that? Acting Associate Dean Randy Singer believes the number one key to success is a passion for journalism. One of the things that really makes applicants stand out for coming to, to uh, the broadcast program is the sense that they know what they want to do. I was delighted to hear that she had decided to come to BCIT um, given that she had the, the scholarship. I'm not completely surprised because I think BCIT has the best broadcast program in Canada. And it's just great having that weight lifted off my shoulders of having to pay for school and take out student loans and get a job. It's just, it's really nice. Braden Notes in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcitbroadcastnews.ca or bcit-broadcast.com. I'm Martin McMahon. And I'm Carmen Weld, and that's today's BCIT Magazine. Thanks so much for watching.